morning and happy Father's Day to all the dads in here this morning. It's wonderful to take a day to celebrate the dads. Uh, you know, we have an awesome number of fathers in this house. And there's many here who are spiritual fathers as well. And we know that we serve the Almighty Father. I know there's many that don't have a dad or for Father's Day, it's a sad day because they don't have a dad, but we do have the, the best dad, our Heavenly Father. And uh, so we want to rejoice in that this morning and give praise to him. Why don't you stand with me? We're going to open our service by singing Christ Be Magnified. For creation suddenly articulate with a thousand tons to lift one cry. That's our prayer today, Lord, that you would be magnified in us, that our life would be a testimony, an example to those around about us, that we would shine your light and make a difference in the darkness that is around us. God, we give you praise this morning as we celebrate Father's Day. We take time to uh, celebrate the men who have impacted our lives, whether they are our biological fathers or mentors in our lives, that they have made a difference. And Father, especially for those who have lived in a way that honors you, we give you praise. Father, I thank you for each man in our congregation here who lives a life that is faithful and holy, that is set apart for you, that they would be an example to the next generation. And so we give you praise for each one of them this morning. Father, for those who are uh, feeling a bit of sorrow this morning, that they, they've lost their father or they've grown up fatherless, Father, we thank you that you are the good father, that you care so much about each one of us and that you're there to wrap your loving arms around us when we go through times of difficulty and sorrow. So we give you praise this morning and we ask your anointing upon the rest of this service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. We have a couple announcements we want to make. I'm not going to say all of our regular announcements. I want to draw your attention to Thursday evening. It's our WM final of the year. We are meeting at 6.30. 
Now, our goal was to raise $3,000. We want to support our missionaries. We give to uh, Ladies uh, Center and also um, uh, other missions. And so we have had a goal of 3,000 and we succeeded. We actually exceeded our goal by double. More than double, we raised 6,000. So we are celebrating this week and Thursday, if you're able to join us, ladies, we're coming at 6.30. If you're on Team Amethyst, you don't have to bring anything but yourself. If you're not on Team Amethyst, please bring a dish and we're going to share together. We will have food together and enjoy that time. So 6.30, not 7 p.m. Please make note of that. Also, this Friday, we're celebrating our grads, uh, the high school grads and junior high grads. So the youth are meeting here at 6.30 p.m. on Friday, and it is going till 10. And I believe they're supposed to bring a swimming suit because it's a pool party celebration at Pastor Adam's house. Also, on Friday, um, on uh, Saturday, no, yeah, we want to remind you about day camp. Day camp is coming up very soon, and the deadline to, to sign up is the 24th. We have 22 kids already registered, so there's 30 spots last, left. Please make sure that you get those uh, in as well. You can get one of the forms at the back or uh, sign in online. At this time, we're going to call our ushers forward for your offerings. I just want to make note that as it is Father's Day, every man who's here today will leave here with a little packet of mints with our church logo on it to let you be reminded how much we care and appreciate our fathers. All right, I'm going to ask Brother Mel if you would open in, off, in prayer this morning. Amen. God bless you as you give. Good morning, everybody. Um, yeah, today I just wanted to start this service with uh, Open the Eyes of My Heart, Lord. I just think it's a great song to get into the posture of worship, to get in the posture of hearing the word. Um, and so I just ask that as we sing it, you would, you would take these few moments to get in the mind space of worshiping, preparing your heart, preparing the eyes of your heart for worship, to hear his word, and not only to hear it, but to be ready to apply it. So I invite you to stand and sing with me. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart, I want to see you, I want to see you, see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory, pour out your power and love. As we sing, holy, 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 open the eyes of my heart, Lord, open the eyes of my heart, I want to see you, I want to see you, open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart, well, I want to see you, well, I want to see you, to see you high and lifted up, 
shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Uh, holy, holy, holy. I want to see you. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. I want to see you.
Oh, I feel like God's speaking to a lot of us right now through that. If anybody's confused as to what that was, uh, that was a demonstration of the gift of tongues and interpretation. It's a way that God uh, miraculously edifies the church through uh, the gift of tongues and then the interpretation. Um, yeah, so praise God for that. Days are gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace, amazing
So I will ask the prayer team to come up. And I just, I invite you, if you have a need on your heart, God wants you to come. God wants you to take the, the 10 steps down the altar to meet with him. 10 steps to meet with God is not a lot of steps. Take those steps. There is a song I know it well A melody that's never failed On mountains high In valleys low My soul will rest my God Oh, no. 
Yeah. 
Lord, we thank you that you care. Lord, we thank you that you sent your son for us so that we may be adopted into your kingdom. And there's such a, it's such a fitting day to celebrate your, 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 your fatherhood to us, Lord, on, on Father's Day, Lord. So we thank you, Abba Father. We thank you that you enable us to be able to call you our dad, that you have adopted us through Jesus Christ, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Bless you. You may be seated. Well, if you looked at the sign outside, if you looked at the sign outside, you saw Pastor Jonathan was supposed to be preaching again today, and he is actually in surgery right now. So uh, we're going to take a moment to, to, yes, we praise the Lord for that. And we want to also take a moment to pray over him as he's in surgery and for a few other needs. I understand Andy and Faye's grandson was taken into emergency surgery yesterday for an appendix burst. And so we want to hold him up. He's five years old, Malachi, and also continue to pray for our pastor Feller and Jim that are dealing with cancer, different issues. So let's just take a moment to pray over these needs this morning. Father, we give you praise that you are a faithful God. You are almighty. You are the great physician. And Father, we know that there is no need that is too big for you. There is no difficulty that is too hard, no trial that is too deep. And Father, it doesn't matter the situations that we go through. We know you are able to use them for our good and for your glory. And so we thank you right now that is Pastor Jonathan has waited 10 days to get into surgery, that you have a purpose and plan in that, and that you are working in him. And I just pray your hand would be upon the doctors right now as they perform this operation and that he would come through with a uh, collarbone in place and that he would heal very quickly. We pray also for little Malachi as he had his appendix rupture yesterday and had surgery and things seem to go well, be going well. We just ask that you would continue to bring restoration and healing to his body. We pray that you would continue to bless the doctors as they, they work through the situation in his life and that he would come through it feeling fine and healthy and able to run and move again. And Father, we pray for Pastor Feller as he continues the chemo treatment. We pray for Jim, the same situation. Father, we know that you are bigger than cancer. You are bigger than any needs that we have. And so, Father, for those that have cancer, for those that are struggling, and when it seems like there is no, no hope even, Father, we know that you are the hope. You are the answer. And Father, if you choose to heal us here, we give you praise. And if you choose that you would take us home and, and heal us for eternity, we give you praise. We ask that your will would be accomplished in our lives for your glory. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, Faith was supposed to be preaching with Pastor Jonathan for Father's Day, but um, a young Kingsler pastor has stepped up in place of Pastor Jonathan, and so the two of them are coming to speak. This is Faith's first time ever preaching. Faith's first time ever preaching here, and I know she's a little nervous. I said, don't worry, we're all family. And then she practiced to Jonathan and I yesterday, and she was so nervous. I was like, I can't help you there. You should just be relaxed with us. So anyway, they're going to do a great job. <laughs> well, we want to wish you a very happy Father's Day. Um, it's a privilege for Faith and me to be uh, sharing together today as we celebrate Father's Day. Um, I just want to start by telling you a few uh, Father's Day jokes. <laughs> so uh, first, I'm wondering, when does a joke become a dad joke? When it becomes a parent's. And where does a dad keep all his jokes? In a database. <laughs> well, now I'll turn it over to Faith. And <laughs> so in our Wonder of the Word sermon series, we have just concluded Exodus. Um, and now we're turning to 2 Corinthians. So you may notice some common themes. Um, some common themes. Um, and now we're looking at chapters 1 to 5 of 2 Corinthians. So Paul's purpose in writing this letter was to defend his ministry. It includes an explanation of the gospel, and which he preaches and lives out. The, the context of this letter is one in which Paul and his audience are suffering. In 2 Corinthians, there are more about suffering than anywhere else. The Corinthian church um, is experiencing suffering partly because of division caused by the false leaders, partly because of this fallen world, and because of persecution they were facing. Similar to most of us, the Corinthians didn't want to suffer. The false teachers were trying to discredit Paul's ministry based on things that uh, he has suffered. They were asking if he has really experienced the blessings of God concerning what he is going through, and should he be trusted as a true apostle. So Paul, Paul starts off by acknowledging the suffering, but highlight, highlighting that this has been God's design and he has a purpose in it. 
2 Corinthians 1, 3 to 7 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's suffering, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that as you share in our suffering, you will also share in our comfort. The Christian's life is now defined as one in Christ. Since we follow him, we will share in both his sufferings and his glory. As Christ suffered on behalf of others, so we too suffer for others. While we suffer for Christ and his purposes, we also experience the comfort that he brings. When we tell others about the gospel in the midst of suffering, they experience comfort through the hope of the gospel message. When they go through difficult times, our lives will testify to them about the hope that God brings. As they trust God, they too will experience the comfort. It is the way we go through suffering and how we live, even in the midst of suffering, which will comfort others. No matter our circumstances, we can have God's peace and to demonstrate the fruit of the Spirit. Next, we see how this applies personally to Paul's life and the suffering he faces. 2 Corinthians 1, 8 to 10 says, For we did not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death, but that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God, who raises the dead. He delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. As he did for Paul, God gives us comfort in our suffering. Because of this comfort that we have received, we're able to comfort others because we know how to help and encourage them. Through, suffer through suffering himself, Paul learned not to rely on himself, but to rely on God. This can be the purpose of suffering as it increases our faith and hope and teaches us to lean on God. Suffering helps us grow and makes us better prepared to face the future. As Christians, we shouldn't regret suffering because it makes us stronger. The end of this letter in 2 Corinthians 12 verse 9, he says, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Paul shows that there are benefits to suffering. We recognize our own weaknesses and learn that we need to rely on God and his strength because we are incapable of enduring suffering by ourselves. This reminds me of the footprints of home where the man is walking along the beach with God and throughout different points in his life, he sees two sets of footprints, except at the lowest point where he only sees one set. However, in these times, he was not alone. Rather, God was always with him, and when he saw one set of footprints, it was because God carried him when the man was too weak to carry himself. So in a world of darkness and difficulty and division, how can we have confidence in the true gospel? In the midst of suffering, three roles of true Christian ministry set us apart as his people. First is that we are servants of a new covenant of glory. Like no other letter in the New Testament except Hebrews, Paul contrasts the new and old covenant. He does this with a particular interest in his own ministry, which stands as an example for all Christians to follow. Paul writes multiple times that we are no longer under the old covenant. The new covenant is better for us. However, there are parallels, so we know how to live under the new covenant because of the old covenant. 2 Corinthians 2, 14 to 17 says, But thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession, and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we are the aroma of Christ to God, among those who are being saved, and among those who are perishing. To, a, to one a fragrance of, from death to death, and to the other a fragrance from life to life. Who is sufficient for these things? For we are not, like so many, peddlers of God's word, but as men of sincerity, as commissioned by God, in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. After being victorious in battle, Roman Caesars would often hold victory processions through cities such as Rome, in order to show off their victory and show the strength of their empire. Part of this parade would have been captives on display in chains. God brings salvation to the world like this triumphant parade, as he announces his victory over sin and death. Believers are like captives that God has won, except that we're not in chains, we're free. Paul expands on this idea as he shows that the captives have become the aroma of Christ. Unlike the awful, unwashed smell of prisoners, Christians have the beautiful aroma of Christ because he is in us and the impact he has on our life should be evident to others. It is Christ at work in us and through us which we spread to others through living out the gospel. The fragrance of the knowledge of God is that others come to know the truth because they see the gospel in our life. 
Now, Paul uses the idea of smell metaphorically, and though it is not an actual scent, it should still be both attractive and inviting to those who are being saved. The sense is powerful as it, has the emotion, as it connects to emotion and brings forth a reaction, whether good or bad. As though walking by a bakery and smelling bread from outside, we just want to go in and have a taste. The gospel message is attractive as it transforms us. When people sense that there is something different about you, they are attracted to Christ in you. Everywhere you go, to those who are receptive to the gospel, we either smell of life, but to those who are perishing, it is the aroma of death. Paul goes on to explain in 2 Corinthians 3, 1 to 6. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need, as some do, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are our letters of recommendation, written on our hearts to be known and read by all. And you show that you are a letter from Christ delivered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not, with, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Such is the confidence that we have to, through Christ toward God. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything as coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God, who has made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. The proof that Paul was commi truly commissioned by God is the transforming nature of the word. Both the gospel message and Paul are the messenger are validated because it, what, it was truly transformational. Again, we see the contrast between the old and the new covenant. The old covenant was written on tablets of stone, symbolizing the permanence of God's revelation. However, the stone tablets were broken when Moses came down from the mountain and found them worshiping the golden calf. This shows that the old covenant itself was not intended to be permanent, but the stone symbolized and pointed toward that which is permanent, the new covenant. The old covenant was intended to expose sin, yet it did not cover our sin. Under the old covenant, the penalty for breaking the law was death, and so we need to recognize and so we recognize our need for salvation, but that the law cannot bring it. This is where the new covenant comes in. As it, best, as it deals with sin permanently, the Spirit writes his law on our hearts when we believe the gospel proclaimed to us. Jeremiah 31, 33 says, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. The covenant is now relational. Instead of being written on stone, it is written on their hearts and in their lives. As, mes as Moses, the messenger, had to carry the message, now the message and the messenger, messenger come together. We are the message because it is th seen through our lives in both our words and deeds. Now returning to 2 Corinthians 3 verse 2, Paul says that they are letters of recommendation. The gospel has had a transforming impact on them. They used to be sinners, but now they have turned to God and live righteously. This confirms Paul's ministry as he spoke the message about the gospel, which had an impact, their transformed lives were evidence that it was the spirit at work through Paul and that he was fulfilling God's purposes. Paul then brings up the issue of glory, which is the outward manifestation of God's character. He compares the glory of the old and the new. 2 Corinthians 3, 7 to 8 says, now if the ministry of death carved in letters on stone came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because it's of its glory, which was being brought to an end, will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory? The old covenant was temporary, lasting only until the coming of Christ. The glory given to Moses was also temporary, as both the glory of the tent and Moses' face were fading. When Moses came out of God's presence, his face was shining, and the Israelites were afraid. We heard about this last week that the glory upon Moses' face reminded people of the wrath of God. It put fear into their minds. They were afraid of God because they knew they deserved punishment. Until they are given a new heart, this too would be temporary. As part of the new covenant, God deals with their sin and guilt, as he says in Jeremiah 31, 34. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Furthermore, we see in 1 John 4, 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has, now, has not been perfected in love. With the new covenant, we experience God's love and forgiveness. The Israelites saw the glory of God reflected in Moses and experienced fear about the punishment of their sins. Rather, in the new covenant, we should have a love for God that includes awe and respect, but not terror. 2 Corinthians 3.14 says, But their minds were hardened, for to this day when they read the old covenant, they, that same veil remains unlifted because only through Christ is it taken away. The people were responsible for their own unbelief. They hardened their hearts 
and instead of seeking God and drawing close to him, they drew away. They distanced themselves from God out of fear. Uh, And while fear can be an incentive not to sin, the only way to be like God is to spend time with him. Paul expresses that when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. With Moses, they turned away, whereas with Jesus, they are capable of seeing him clearly. This includes his compassion, his mercy, and his love. With John 3.16, they see God's love through how he gave his son and how he was willing to because of his love for them. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. He not only set us free from sin, but made us righteous. How are we made righteous? Well, our memory verse tells us that it is through the spirit which has been given to us. Our memory verse is 2 Corinthians 3.18. Let's say this memory verse all together. And And we we all, all, with with unveiled face, beholding the the glory glory of the Lord, are are being being transformed transformed into the same same image from one one degree of glory to another. For For this this comes comes from from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So God has given us life, and this results in several things. First is that this with unveiled face refers to there is nothing separating us, but there is nothing between us and God. We can talk to God anytime. There is no separation, no obstacle, and no distance. We have been forgiven of our sin, which in the Old Testament would have stopped us from being able to experience God's presence. Secondly is that we behold the glory of the Lamb. This refers to ongoing communion with him. We can meditate on his presence, and we're just able to be with him. The glory of the Lord is imprinted on us, and so... Um, as, and so it's reflected from us as we spend time in God's presence. Yet this was temporary. Or, okay, sorry. Similarly to how Moses was in the presence of God, and God's glory was physically seen and reflected on his face, yet this was temporary. We can always spend time with God, and as we do so, it is evident to others. We reflect him to others, which leads to the next part, that we are being transformed into the same image, into the image of Christ. We have the same purpose and are, tra- and are conformed into the character that Christ has. Our transformation is not our doing, but the spirit at work in our hearts. So as servants of the new covenant in Christ, we have his character. Paul lets us know that our character should be in contrast to the world. So the first characteristic is that we are servants of a new covenant in glory. And the second is that we are sharers of a new creation in Christ. So, Christ has not only brought us forgiveness of sins, he has brought about a whole new creation to a new order of life. In 2 Corinthians 5.17, we see Paul say, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Now, this this is a very uh, common verse. You guys have probably all heard it before. But it's important to note here that even as The first creation was a process in Genesis. The new creation with Christ is also a process. As soon as we accept Christ, we begin the process of sanctification where God makes us more like himself. When God was first creating people, before he created anything in Genesis 1, we see that darkness was over the face of the deep. Just as there was darkness before God started creation, there is darkness in our hearts before we are made into a new creation. Paul makes clear that Satan has, uh, has veiled believers' eyes from being able to see the light. In 2 Corinthians 4, verse 3 to 4, it says, And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world, Satan, has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So God first created light, in Genesis, saying, let there be light. And the fact that it was created first just shows its importance. And in the next coming verses, he says in verse 6, For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. We are changed by his light. And it takes away the darkness that was in our hearts. Along with the veil of darkness being removed, death has also been overcome. While death remains an enemy of humanity, it no longer rules over God's people. We've been delivered from fear of death, and now death has become a gateway to glory for God's people. While resurrection was thought to belong to the end of history, Christ's resurrection has inaugurated new life for those who receive him. Paul talks about 
the life that we have now. That is, his light within us. He continues to develop this idea in the next verse, verse 7, saying, But we have this treasure in jars of clay, to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not us. Now, jars of clay were probably the most common way to store things um, in the ancient world. People put all kinds of things in them, from oil to water to waste and even treasure, as you see in this verse. Yes, treasure. People would sometimes hide their treasure in jars of clay, because where would you think to look? You wouldn't think to look where the oil is stored, right? You would think to look in another place, but they would hide in jars of clay. So how are we like jars of clay that have this treasure inside? Well, for one, clay is molded into jars just as God has molded us. And two, when people look at us from the outside, they may not see anything different in us, but new life has begun. The treasure is that the Holy Spirit gives us life and is in us. The reason why God chooses to do this is to make plain that it's his work and not ours. He gets the praise and the attention, not us. Um, now, what does th- having this treasure in us look like? In verses 8 and 9 of chapter 4, it says, We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, forsaken. struck down, but not destroyed. Now, while these may be difficult times, God is clearly at work in us. He helps us to fulfill his will for our lives. That we might deny ourselves, be crucified in the flesh, follow Jesus all the way to the cross, and choose to live for righteousness. Now, we handle trouble differently than the world. New creation life means that the spirit who raised Jesus from the dead is in us. So what's the result of this different life, of this treasure that we have in jars of clay? In 2 Corinthians 4, verse 15 to 18, it says, For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart. Through, though our inner self is wasting away, sorry, though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. This is the purpose that God has for us in this time. As grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. We can always live with hope and not lose heart because God is powerfully at work in and through us. Now, What does Paul mean here by light momentary affliction? He's actually talking about suffering and everything that we go through on earth. Sometimes we're guilty of thinking things like, man, my life is so hard. I have so much work to get done in so little time. Or you might say, oh, I'm going through so much right now. How could I be grateful? Well, in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23 to 28, Paul talks about his suffering. He says, are they servants of Christ? I'm a better one. I'm talking like a madman here. So he's, he's acknowledging that he's boasting in his suffering, right? And he continues on, with far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings, and often near death. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A day and night I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger in the sea, danger from false brothers, in toils and hardships, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. And apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. Wow. Wow. That's, uh, that's pretty light stuff, huh? You can really see why he calls them a light momentary affliction, right? No! Obviously not! <laughs> right? So, why does he downplay his suffering, calling it a light momentary affliction? Well, it's because of what God has in store for us. Because this life is temporary. It's not the end of the story. 
God will more than make it up to us. In Romans 8, verse 18, Paul says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time, all that we just listed, are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. So our suffering is producing an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. When we, when we think that we've suffered a lot, just think about Paul, who called all that we just heard about a light momentary affliction. Now, we can also look at how Joseph um, was caused by God to forget all his years of suffering, slavery, and imprisonment because of the great blessing he received afterward, naming his firstborn Manasseh, which means to forget. In verse 18, Paul talks about the unseen, which is eternal. So, what is this unseen that we keep our eyes on? Well, it is the work of his spirit in and through us as we receive that we receive as a result of Christ's redemptive work. With this talk about the spirit being in us, you might be thinking, what about our body, which is compared compared to a jar of clay? It's so fragile, right? The answer to this question can be found in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 1 to 5. It says, For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens, For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling, if indeed by putting it on we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. Isn't that a great resurrection text? Paul's comparing our bodies with places to live. And death does not mean the end of bodily existence so that our soul would be released from our bodies. Rather, we long to be clothed in the new resurrection body that God has for us. This idea was so different from the Greek way of looking at things. If you look at Plato, he talks about how only the spiritual is real. We only see a a shadow of life. The physical is just a shadow of the spiritual. On the other hand, Jesus teaches that both the physical and spiritual are real, and that we are given new spiritual and material bodies by which we are made new in Christ. God has made our physical bodies so that we would glorify him with them, just as we will with our new resurrection bodies. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 42 to 44, Paul talks about how our physical, Physical bodies are being compared to a seed. They're sown in mortality and raised in immortality, sown in corruption and raised incorruptible. He has made our bodies for his purpose and his glory. Another imagery that Paul gives in our text is that our bodies can be paired with a temporary tent, like we just read about. Just as our current bodies are temporary and we will die on this earth, so is a tent. However, this shows how great heaven is. We will be given new permanent bodies, like the permanent dwelling, signifying God's purpose for us to be with him forever. The guarantee of the resurrection body we are to receive is the spirit, which he has given to live in us now. So how do we know that we have the spirit? Well, first we receive the spirit by faith in Christ. Second, the Spirit brings us closer to God, by which we cry, Abba, Father. Third, the Spirit causes us to hate sin and want to turn from it. Fourth, the Spirit brings, makes us more into Christ's image every day. And lastly, the Spirit brings us peace and joy and the rest of the fruits of the Spirit that are evident in the life of a Christian. So, if we know that we have the Spirit and we will be given new bodies when we go to live with Christ, what should be our response to this news. Well, Paul says twice in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 6 and 8, we are of good courage. Because we know that God has given us the Spirit, prepared our eternal home, and guaranteed us a new resurrection body, we can be of good courage. In addition, Paul reminds us of what our purpose is in 2 Corinthians 5, 9. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. Trying to please the Lord connects this life with the next. Growth in Christ doesn't end here, but continues on to eternity. And lastly, 
In 2 Corinthians 5, 10 to 11, Paul says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one, each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. Now, this judgment seat of, of Christ is not something to be feared for us. As Christians, the judgment seat is about salvation. It, sorry, the judgment seat is not about salvation. This has already been won and given to us as Christians. This is about reward and receiving the glory that God promises to us. But we live in the fear of the Lord. Now, this does not mean that the, we live as the Israelites did in the wilderness. Rather, we live with proper awe and respect because we've received his love. We have a relationship with God now. We do our best to tell others of what God has done and to share this relationship that we have with God. In 2 Corinthians 5, verse 5, Paul says, He who has prepared for us this very thing is God. And this brings us back to the question in 2 Corinthians 2, verse 16. Who is sufficient for these things? God is sufficient. He is our strength. Hope, life, and peace come from him. This is what it means to be sharers of a new creation in Christ. So we are servants of a new covenant in glory, sharers of a new creation in Christ, and finally, subjects of a new community of holiness. 2 Corinthians 6, 14 to 7, verse 1 says, Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? Or what proportion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God says, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing. Then I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of the Lord. In 2 Corinthians 7, verse 1, Paul calls us to cleanse ourselves and be holy for God. Holy, holiness means to be set apart for God and characterized by him. As we live for God, we are separate from, the, from sin and the world. We are only holy because of our association and relationship with God. And so as, we, as our lives are dedicated to him, we become holy. As our hearts and lives are transformed to reflect God, our thoughts and action, actions should align with the change we experience. Holiness and sinfulness are in direct contrast to each other and cannot coexist. Paul brings, brings this out in 2 Corinthians 6.14. <clears throat> Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? They do not have anything in common. And so one who seeks to be holy and in relationship with God will also seek to be separate from sin. With the goal of being and becoming holy in 2 Corinthians 6.14, Paul instructs us not to be yoked with unbelievers and those who have different beliefs and values than we do. This may be those people who believe in a different gospel and then act according to those differing beliefs, or those who claim to believe in the same gospel, yet do not act, and whose actions actually contradict it. When Paul refers to being yoked together with someone, it refers to the Old Testament agricultural practice of harnessing two animals together to accomplish the plowing. A yoke was a wooden bar that joined two animals at the neck with a circular wooden halter around each neck. The two animals became attached to each other, so that as they, pull, as they pull together, the power of the two animals multiplies. However, if the animals uh, want to go in different directions, they only fight against each other, and um, they are both worn down. Similarly, if we are yoked together with others who hold different goals, they will influence us and lead us astray. Paul warns them to be careful of who they join with and walk alongside, because it makes life more difficult being with someone who has different priorities. And now Christian is going to stand on this chair representing someone with high moral value, and I'm going to represent someone in the world. Christian is going to try to pull me up to his level, but with gravity, it isn't easy to pull others up to your level. Also, I just want to say, in our practice, it did not go like that. So Paul's warning here is that those who, have, who live at a higher standard will be influenced and pulled down by those who live in a worldly way. In the same way that two different animals cannot plow in unity, unbelievers will create dissonance in the community, whereas true believers who seek God lead to harmony and agreement. 
While Paul was writing this, many Christians in Corinth had been led astray by the idolatry around them. This, the surrounding nations believed in many gods, and they also then practiced and worshipped differently than Christians who followed Christ. This act of idolatry is similar to how Solomon was led astray by his many wives and all their differing beliefs and different gods. Matthew 6, 24 says, No one can serve two masters, for, he will, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. If we do not hate sin, which is in contrast to God, how devoted are we to him? And are we completely living for God? Paul reminds Christians to be solely focused on God and not distracted by other beliefs or practices. Paul is not warning against being yoked with other believers in general, but rather with being unequally yoked. We need to be joined with other believers because we are strengthened by them and are both working for the purposes of God's mission. We should be yoked to other believers in order to fulfill God's purpose, as our first devotion is always to God. We need to be devoted to others, and as we see in Exodus 20, verse 3, the first commandment says, You shall have no other gods before me. He should be our first priority as we serve him with our thoughts and actions, showing that we are devoted to him as we claim. Similarly, Deuteronomy 6, verse 5 says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. This command is to love God with our whole being, committing our lives to him. In this way, when we are living for him, we are set apart from sin and the world since our life is devoted to him. We should not be pulled away or led astray from this relationship with him. And we need to recognize the importance it holds in our life. Um, and rather that, and rather, we should cling to God also, recognizing our need for him and appreciating the intimate relationship that he allows us to have with him. We've looked at being yoked with others, being devoted to God, and now we see another strong bond, which is the image of family. 2 Corinthians 6 verse 18 says, And I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. A child learns from their father and represents him. Now, for my family, I know that Christian looks a lot like my dad, and I have a similar sense of humor to him, so we laugh at the same jokes. We naturally are like our parents and have similarities to them. It should be the same way with our Heavenly Father. As his children, we should strive for holiness since our Heavenly Father is holy. Furthermore, we are able to be in this close relationship with him, and it should define us. As we are set apart for God, we should be known for representing him, and, it sh and we should be known for representing him and the character of God. As was mentioned in last week's sermon, people become like the gods they serve. While some serve lifeless idols, we serve the living God, and so we should be known for being full of life and Christ-like character. The respect and honor that we have for God leads us to imitate him and become pure and holy as God is. 1 Peter 4, 1, verse 14 to 15 says, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. When we become children of God, we cannot continue to live in sin and persist in living out desires which contradict God's character. As the children of God, we should be known for emulating and resembling the character of God. As we are God's children, we should be in close relationship with him. We are God's people, and as we see through Exodus and the building of the temple, that God wants to dwell with his people. 2 Corinthians 6, verse 16 says, As God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Once again, this shows the intimate relationship that we can have with him. As we have his presence and a closeness with him, when living or walking with someone, it connects you and builds a relationship between you. It should be the same in our relationship with God. This also relates back to the Garden of Eden, where God walked with Adam and Eve before they fell into sin. There was no obstacle standing in the way of their relationship. However, when Jesus died and took our sin, we were once again able to walk in this unrestricted way with him. He wants us to be fully committed to him. And so as we devote more and more of our life to God, our relationship with him will grow. This verse continues that, as, that he will be our God and so we will be his people. This again shows the importance of placing God in the proper position in our life and giving him the honor he deserves. He need, we need to act as his people, representing him and living as he commands. At Pentecost, God gave us his spirit and we became the church, his temple. Whereas in the Old Testament, God's presence dwelt in the physical temple and the people had limited access, now God dwells with each person. As 2 Corinthians 6.16 says, 
for we are the temple of the living God. The significance of this is that God dwells with us individually. Each person has his presence all the time. This is so awesome that we can always go to God because he is always with us and there are no restrictions. It is no longer the building that makes up the church or contains God's presence, but the people. As the dwelling place of God, it is more important that the church has nothing to do with idols, wickedness, or dishonesty. Individuals within the church need to be completely loyal to God and separate from sin, since God's presence is with them and God is separate from sin. This whole passage is about living as a community, not as an individual or couple. Often this passage has been used in reference to marriage and to show the importance of marrying someone who is also Christian so that you are strong, not strongly influenced by an unbeliever. While this can be applied in this situation, the context of this is to the community, ensuring that they are not influenced by false teachings. The church body as a whole needs to remain pure and focused on Christ and not be influenced by outside or wrong beliefs. The church should be different from the culture around us. We have been transformed and lived for Christ, and this should influence our whole life so that we, are, so that we stand apart from the world. Not only are believers to be set apart from sin and therefore the world, but we should also be joined in community with fellow Christians to fulfill his ministry. However, since the church should not be living with and according to false beliefs, that brings up the question of how should we interact and treat unbelievers. In 2 Timothy 2, Paul notes the general aspects of a Christian leader, and in 2.25 says, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth. When dealing with others, we need to treat others with gentleness and kindness, living as an example of the truth, so that our lives may be evidence to God's character. Titus 2, 7 to 8 says, to show yourselves in all respects to be a model of good works, and in your teaching, show, dignity, show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned, so that an opponent may be put to shame, having nothing evil to say about us. When interacting with unbelievers and those who disagree about our beliefs, we need to act as a good example with integrity. We should not stoop to their level or be persuaded to act as they have. Since we are set apart, we need to treat them with love as God has commanded us. However, we still need to bring correction as we act in truth and love. If the church community as a whole seeks God and a greater holiness for themselves, this will result in a couple things. The first is that it will lead to a higher level of respect and reverence for God. The second thing is that as we come together to glorify God, we will have increased affection and joy with other people who are part of the community. 2 Corinthians 7 verse 1 tells us to bring holiness to completion in the fear of God. We can only become holy when we recognize the significance of the role it plays in our life. Then we will be capable of maturing in our faith and belief in him, uh, and our belief in him, him will change our life and make us more like him. When we recognize God's character and are in awe of who he is, this should lead us to live holy so that our whole life is in worship to him. So though we live in a world of darkness, difficulty and division, we can have confidence in the true gospel because we are, number one, servants in the new covenant of, in glory, sharers in, of a new creation in Christ, and lastly, subjects of a new community of holiness. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you that you are so loving and you have made us a new creation in you, God, that you've given your you have given us a new life in you, and you are perfecting us as we grow near to uh, the day of completion, Lord. And Lord, we pray that uh, as we go out today, we would be able to share uh, this relationship that we have with you, God, and just encourage other believers as we try to be equally yoked with them, Lord. And we thank you for everything that you do in our lives, and we pray that uh, this, your spirit will continue to guide us as we go. And you may pray. Amen. Amen. What a good word and encouragement to us to be holy. And as we suffer, we don't suffer in vain. This is uh, a little bit of the sermon Pastor Jonathan was working on as he experienced a little bit of suffering. He said, maybe God just wants me to 
to know how it is to suffer a little bit more as I prepare to say, you know what, we suffer and we know that his purpose is being accomplished in the midst of the suffering. It's for his glory. We, we don't suffer in vain. And so uh, we give him praise that though we suffer, we know that he has a purpose that he's accomplishing as he builds us into his image. Why don't you stand with me? We're going to close by singing that he is the one who is holy forever.
Lord, that you are the Holy One. God, we give you the glory that even though we go through suffering, we know you're making us into a new creation. That we have the community of believers around about us. That we support each other. We encourage each other. And Father, that we keep each other accountable so that we stay on focus. Stay focused on the word of God. Stay true to who you are. So that we can uh, live a life that when we finish this race, you will say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Lord, I pray that you would uh, continue to instill within each one of us that desire to please you, to walk in your way. That you would continue to call us back to yourself when we do things that are wrong and that you will continue to work on our hearts and lives. We give you praise. We ask that you would bless each father who is here today and, and that you would be calling each man to be faithful and holy. In your precious name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Happy Father's Day. Have a great week.